Uh, oh no. Hello? Hello? It was just working. Hello? My camera isn't working. Why? Why, 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 why? What do I do? Hold on, hold, 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 hold. Tough start, rough start, but hi, we're here, we're here, we're here, we're ready, we're ready, we're ready. I'm sorry, I'm a, a few minutes late, a couple minutes late. Um, podcast today, tweet that you're live. I'll tweet after the podcast. Um, thank you for the reminder, I messed that up today. All right. As you can see by the title, today we have the Ojai Raptor Center. Speaking of raptors, look at these sick new disc plates that I got. That's a Kestrel, an American Kestrel. And this is, this says, the message is simple. Love and conserve our wildlife. That's a Steve Irwin quote. Isn't that sick? You can do command display in chat. <clears throat> oh, don't do command display in chat. That command is incorrect. Um, that, that promotion is expired. Okay, so rough start, but... Um, Okay, let's just forget about all that, guys. Today we're talking. <laughs> today we're today we're talking to the Ohio Raptor Center. Um, I've talked about them a little bit before. This is the uh, Wildlife Rehabilitation Center that um, had been for a few weeks before we released him. Um, they're they're located in Ohio, which is like SoCal. Where um, we are talking to Jacqueline today. And she wears lots of hats at the Ohio Raptor Center. Um, Jacqueline DeSantis, um, she does some social media for them. She helps with their education department. She even oversees some of the medical stuff with the patients that they bring into the Raptor Center. So we have a lot to talk to her about today. Um, it should be really, really cool. So donations go there today, obviously. You guys know how it works by now. Um, Let's just get going. Let's just get let's just get started. You guys, great questions as as always. Last time, great questions. This time, I'm hoping for the same. Um, you guys help carry the podcast, and I appreciate it. And I want to know what you guys what you guys want to learn up. about. Okay, you mute alerts. Thank you for the reminder. Um, but Roz, thank you Jeez. for the thank you thank you for the sub, and not thank you for the sub. All right, good. Now we're ready. Now we're really ready to go. I think. Let me know if I'm missing anything, but I think we should be good to go. Three dollars, Arcadian, getting us rolling. Thank you very much. Okay. Podcast filter. That's an L. I'll see you guys in 20 seconds. Good, how are you? Great. Not for you, for them. 
Um, anonymous with five dollar donation. Thank you so much. Um, everybody, this is Jacqueline from the Ojai Raptor Center. Um, I, I told them in the intro that you wear many hats at the, at the Raptor Center. So social media, outreach, um, medical care for the patients there. Yeah, yeah, I've been in the Raptor Center for 11 years. Um, I oversee the medical care for patients. Um, we're all pretty much all volunteer based besides myself and two other employees. So I kind of do volunteer coordination. Um, uh, I oversee the education program, our education outreach program. I train the ambassador birds that are unreleasable. So yeah, um, I do wear many hats at the center. <laughs> Cool. Um, I'm here. The apparent there's an. Is it okay now? Is there still an echo, guys? Are we good? No, it's not with you. Audio's fine. It's better. Cool. Yes, there is. Should I try to? Uh, it's not with you. Can you hear it? Sorry about this. <laughs> oh, Hold do on. Do. do I have echo? Um, I'm not sure. I think you're fine. Guys, should I should I just leave it's it? The mic. Put the mic up there. Put the mic up here. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna call it fine for now, guys. Let me know if it if it gets um, disruptive um, later. Okay, cool. So, okay, so you do a lot of stuff with the Raptor Center, and you've been with them for eleven years. Oh, that's, crazy. Yeah. that's crazy. Okay, so how did you? Uh, well, actually, before we before I ask about how you got into that, can you tell us about what they're donating to? We have eight dollars in donations so far, guys. Thank you. Um, but so, what is it that the Raptor Center does? Yes, yeah, so the Ojai Raptor Center, we're a wildlife rehabilitation center. So we're basically like an animal hospital, but we are only licensed to take in wildlife. Um, we are licensed to take in any injured, orphaned, or sick wild animal. It doesn't matter what it is, but we do specialize in raptors or birds of prey. So um, we receive any other kind of animal, like for example, we, we received uh, an injured fox like three days ago. What we will do is wow. stabilize and triage that animal at our center and then we'll transfer them to a rehabilitator that specializes in that species. Um, but we take in about a thousand animals a year. Oh my and, gosh. Yeah, and our release rate is about 70%. Of course, it fluctuates year to year, but it's uh, in that range, it's far, it's definitely over 50%. We're pretty proud of our release rate, and that's always our main goal. Um, and that's really my main thing that I always like to tell people, because when I do education outreach, I take the unreleasable ambassadors, and I really stress that you know, rehabilitation release is our main goal. Um, that's why all of us got into this work is to release these animals back to the wild. It's not to keep them in captivity. That's never our goal. Um, and then we do have a small group of ambassadors. So those are our non-releasable birds that meaning they would not survive if we release them to the wild for various issues for their permanent injuries. And then we train them to be education ambassadors. So, and that can take months or years um, depending on their personality because they're each different. So. That's um, yeah. awesome. I didn't know your release rate was so high. Um, are, so, But most of the animals that you intake are birds of prey, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's our specialty. We also do, the only other animal that we'll do throughout its entire rehab process are opossums because uh -huh. they're, they're really easy. We love opossums. Um, but pretty much every other animal besides raptors, um, and some other birds that we will do for the full course, but mostly everything else will get transferred to our colleagues, um, either at California Wildlife Center or at Santa Barbara Wildlife Care Network. Okay, awesome. So for the viewers today that, that choose to donate, guys, thank you to Anonymous and Arcadian for already doing that. Where, where do those donations go? So yeah, that goes to our year round. I mean, mostly rehabilitation is our main thing. Like I said, we do do education. And I have to say when I first, went to the center, I was a volunteer as everyone else is, and I kind of had mixed emotions about seeing birds permanently in captivity because I personally just not into that really. Um, but after I got involved, heavily involved with the education program and being there for 11 years, I can tell you that at least 85 to 90 percent of these cases are coming in because of some kind of human-induced cause, some kind of negative impact that humans are causing to wildlife. Mm -hmm. So I think the education program is really important and what bad that can't be released they have a really important job to educate the public because we're so kind of dis, you know dis, uh, or not attached to nature mm -hmm. and so a lot of the things are things that people are doing that they're not even aware of so um over the years yeah i've really kind of taken a passion to our education program also so 
But long story short, donations will go to all of that, but mostly to our rehabilitation efforts throughout the year. Okay, very cool. Um, my stream is is familiar with um, familiar with you guys a little bit because I had a, a red tail that um, was brought to your your center not too long ago, and we just released him. Um, oh, great. Yeah, yeah. So his his name was Bean. They got to watch him on stream a little bit um, when I was going through the rehab process with him. Um, so it was super super exciting that we got to that we got to do that through your through the help of of you guys. That was really really cool. Um, so guys, this is the center that I had talked to you about before. Of they they have a really cool. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jacqueline. Um, but a really cool uh, flight cage, and they have these live prey tanks. Um, so it's a really great environment for a bird to to build up strength and and to be able to to start pursuing live prey on their own again. Sniper with twenty five dollars. Thank you so much Maya, for doing that. Does she have like headset headphones? Um, Jacqueline, do you happen to have a set of headphones? Um, I I um, I'm trying to think if I have a pair that fits in this phone. Okay, that's okay. Um, no worries, no worries. Um. But yeah, so we're we were super super excited about about being able to release Bean. Um, let's see. Okay, I have. Uh, pardon? Sorry, go no, go ahead. I was just wondering what case. I wish I had known which case it was before I came on to the chat. Yeah. You know what was wrong with the red tail? Um, we picked him up about a year ago. Um, oh. not super sure what was wrong with him, but he was. We found him in Paso Robles. Um, oh. he he was brought in by my my friend Garrett. Um. And he was in your really big flight cage oh, with the three other red tails or, or yeah, something like that. I know exactly which red tail this is. So oh, yeah? Is, yeah, so this is just, this bird just needed to kind of get some, like, training, some hunting time to make sure it could be released. But it was an adult, yes. right? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know which, I wouldn't know which hawk this is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> text with, anonymous with another $10, text with $10, and panda with $12. Thank you guys so much. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. I, I, that was the first time I had been to your facility is when I went to go pick him up, um, oh, okay. to, to release him. So it was super neat. Guys, they have, how many birds do you have at, at your facility right now? Um, you mean like patients as yes. well as ambassadors? Uh-huh. Mm, it literally fluctuates every day. But right now I would say with patients as well as permanent residents, we probably have about, mm, like 40 maybe. Nice. That's right cool. Now, for sure. Um, during spring and summer, we're like close to 300 pretty much throughout the summer. We have a lot. 300. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's a lot of birds. Yeah. And nesting, nesting season is crazy for any wildlife rehabilitator. Um, it's, yeah, for many reasons. And, you know, birds and all animals, they kind of have a different season, each of them, when they actually rear their young and when that young is old enough to fledge and be there on their own. So yeah, our nesting season starts in like March and doesn't end until about August. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so you had, I remember seeing barn owls, you had Mississippi kites, which I had never seen in person before. And those are so cool. Yeah. Here, wait, let me look, let me show them a picture of that. <clears throat> and then you also have a leucistic vulture rob rob with ten dollars thank you so much um these are the kites you guys look how cute they are they're so cool yeah and you're based in, obviously you're based in california so yeah here we have, we have white-tailed kites formerly named black uh black-shouldered kites in california um that mississippi kite i believe somebody illegally brought him into the state um and then the bird actually broke his leg and whoever had him dumped him in the, the front step of the veterinarian's office, probably because they didn't want to get in trouble for having a protected species illegally. So um, you will never see them. They're pretty unique to the Midwest, um, but you will see white-tailed kites. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Yes. Look like, yeah, they both have the, the scarlet red eyes, but they just look a little different. Cool. So how is it that you, how did you get into working with the Raptor Center? Um, let's see, what part of the story should I tell? It's kind of, it's kind of like a series of synchronistic events that happened. Uh, 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 where, like, which part should I start from? I think really my cat um, attacked uh, some baby opossums. And one was dead, uh -oh. died, and I was like, I'm going to save you too. And after two days, I realized that I didn't really know what I was doing, and I needed help. So I went on the internet, 
looking for some forms of help. And at that point, I didn't even know that wildlife rehabilitation was a thing. I didn't know it existed. And uh, I got a hold of this woman. She I learned how to be able to like fix animals. It just make me a better human. Like, how can I learn how to do this from you? And right. she, was very, and she was very cautionary. Like, nobody gets paid for this work. I'm like, that's fine. I'm not in, I don't want to do it to get paid. I just want to learn how to fix animals. That's so cool, you know? Yeah. But then she, you know, she asked what, you know, what species do you want to work with? Because they're all so unique and different. And um, because of an experience I had with a red-tailed hawk, mm -hmm. uh, I, I mentioned, you know, hawks. And she was like, Kim Stroud at the Raptor Center. And I was one of Kim's first volunteers. And that was, yeah, in 2000, that was actually in 2007, so. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and so your day-to-day -day is, looks like what? So you do, I, I've already, we, we've already kind of talked about um, the crazy amount of stuff that you do, um, but what is your, what does your day look like, an average day for you? So first thing, the patients always come first. Um, you know, and, the, and when I say patients, I mean patients that are inside of our hospital. So I don't know if when you got the tour, you were probably with Kim. Mm -hmm. Inside of our hospital, that's kind of where like our ICU pa patients are or any animal that comes in first. They're usually in a bad way and they need, you know, daily medication or daily checkup. So the ones in the hospital take precedence um, for a while to get everybody medicated, fed, you know, wraps, wing wraps changed, whatever is needed. That takes a couple of hours. Um, and we're always there with the help of a great volunteer team. We have a bunch of committed volunteers. I think, I don't know if I mentioned that, but um, as a 501c3 nonprofit, we don't receive any funds from the government. We're not funded. We rely on private donations and the help of volunteers. Mm -hmm. So the volunteers are doing a lot of the like cleaning and maintenance work. Um, while I'm kind of tending to a lot of the patients, they're outside cleaning all of the aviaries. So once the our patients kind of graduate from the hospital once they don't need daily care. And I think it's really important to understand because a lot of people don't understand why we're not open to the public, especially we just had our big open house on Sunday. Yeah, we're I heard about that. Yeah, we're only open to the public like one day a year. And the reason why is because we're not a sanctuary or a zoo. And I think it's really difficult for people to understand, especially with a lot of things that are shown on social media, the fact that wild animals do not like the presence or company of humans. They're right. natu yeah, they're naturally supposed to be terrified of humans. So we try and limit our exposure to them. Um, we really just limit it to absolute necessity, which is feeding, cleaning if it's necessary necessary if it's they're really stressed we'll sometimes forego cleaning um and of course like medical checks and you know medical care so once they go outside they don't have to see us every day um and they just get a little less care and that's the the flights that you saw outside like mm -hmm. uh, our freedom flight which is the largest aviary in all of california for raptors and rehabilitation so mm -hmm. they'll go so there's a series of steps that they'll go through. First, they'll go to some intermediate caging outside, and then they'll finally go into the, the final flight, which would be that one, or right. we have a for owls. Um, so, so that's, our, that's where Bean was, you guys. Yeah, that, yeah. That big, big flight big. cage, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so day-to-day, -day, every day, is of course tending to the patients, answering phone calls, which is just nonstop all day long. Um, you'd be surprised. <laughs> how much that's a part of my job also. Uh, a lot of people are under the impression that we're also a pest control company, which we're not. So it's a lot, it's so many fields. Interesting. And yeah. And, um, and then of course, if we have education programs, um, there's, you know, I have to go off and do that. Overseeing volunteers, feeding and medicating and cleaning. Yeah. Yeah. That's... <laughs> That'll keep you busy. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds so like enough. Yeah. There's a lot. Feeding and cleaning is the basis of most animal husbandry. So yeah, that's, a lot of it and i don't know if kim told you we also um we do breed our own rats because uh -huh. we are dealing with raptors so that makes up the majority of their diet uh we also like for example if caltrans is called if they have a car hit deer uh they will bring us the dead deer and either myself or the director will butcher it and oh, we process cool. for like all of the vultures and the eagles um so it kind yeah there's kind of surprises every day i was surprised with the deer i had to butcher last week and i was really not in the mood to do it but um but yeah we do <laughs> we do we do and then you know there's patients coming in all the time so yeah it kind of changes but but that's basically it what 
that's a lot. <laughs> that's really cool. I, I like that. I like that idea of, of, of receiving deer and, and doing that yourself. That's awesome. Um, yeah. One thing that I talked to Kim about when I was at the center was, was your barn owl box um, program. I haven't heard of anything like that. I thought that was so, so cool. Could you talk about that a little bit? I could talk a lot about it. It's like, how much do you want me to talk about it? Cool. No, as yeah. much as you'd like. Okay. I actually do talks just about this because before we talk about the box, I'll talk about why they're so important. And so what, what we're talking about are literally their owl houses or owl boxes, and you can put them up to try and attract. It specifically works for this one species of owl called the barn owl. They're the white faced owl. Um, and they're also known as the, the farmer's best friend because they make absolutely the best rodent control out of anything or any, any creature or anything. That's what I'm going to get to in a moment. Um, so the reason why they're so important and the reason why we're really pushing this is because rodenticide or rat poisoning is probably the most, it's not probably, it's the most detrimental thing that we're doing to wildlife populations, not just raptors. I don't know if you're familiar, Maya, that we had two new mountain lions that were pronounced dead uh, just in the past three months because of rat poison. I had not heard of that. Yeah. So two of our tagged local mountain lions. Uh, so that makes three this oh my year gosh. because of rat poison. Rat poison, it's, I, I speak at nauseam about this because mm -hmm. here's the deal. I usually, when I do education programs, I usually bring a bait box with me. Uh, I, am I, can the audience see me? I don't have one on me. But anyways, every, the, the reason why I bring them is because everyone sees these things every day. But the thing I find interesting is that a lot of people don't actually know what they are. So what rat bait boxes are, they're like these either usually black or green plastic boxes yes they're everywhere you will see them usually on the perimeter like the outside perimeter of buildings they're in every single shopping center every school every supermarket every restaurant um, they're literally everywhere and here's the way it works is that people are under the impression that rats go or mice go in these boxes eat the poison and die that's not how it works at all the rodents go in the box, they eat the poison, and then they can live up to two weeks after that, and they go about their merry way wherever they want to go. And during that time, they're slowly dying, and they're becoming mm -hmm. more slow. And that makes them an easier target for every single thing that's higher on the food chain than them. Mm -hmm. So we're talking coyotes, bobcats, foxes, raptors, um, skunks. I mean, we're talking absolutely everything on the food chain, which anything that's a that's a carnivore is going to be predating on on rodents they make up a huge part of our food chain mm -hmm. so it affects different animals differently um raptors or birds of prey they're really small their systems are more sensitive than large mammals of course so a lot of times there's not not a whole lot that we can do to save them and usually they will die when they've ingested secondary poisoning from rat poisoning yeah Honestly, so aside from wildlife i think this is also interesting people just don't care at all about wildlife um, 50,000 domestic animals are admitted to veterinarians' offices every year for ingesting this stuff, and 10,000 children are admitted each year to hospitals because of admitting uh, or ingesting rat poison. Rat either poison? Yeah. So what plant companies tell people is, oh, well, it's perfectly safe. This new formulation doesn't cause secondary poisoning. And I can tell you there's absolutely no such thing as safe poison. Mm -hmm. We've learned this over the years. Time and time again, there's literally, it's not possible to say, I'm going to use a poison to kill this one thing in the environment. And nothing and else. Yeah, and expect it to not have uh, consequences and effects, not just owls, but like literally every single thing in the food chain. I mean, there's a great quote by, I think it's um, John Murr, where he says, you know, if you target one thing in the, the universe, you'll find that mm -hmm. everything falling down because you can't just isolate one part of the food chain or the ecosystem and say, I just want to kill this one thing. Uh, we learned that with DDT. Are you, are yes. you familiar? I think that your audience is familiar with DDT. Are you guys familiar with DDT? Have we talked about that with birds of prey and no, no, I guess not. I haven't really talked about that. Some All people right. are. I'm just going to talk about it really quick because I, it bears referencing because it's so interesting that this is a poison that's been illegal for 40 for 50 years banned for 50 years and we're actually still finding traces of it in our soil in our water and in eggshells of birds and in wildlife so we just simply can't predict how this stuff is going to affect our environment 50 years from now so what ddt did i'm sure all of your audience is aware of the fact that bald eagles almost went extinct mm -hmm. everybody knows this 
Peregrine falcons also almost went extinct and they both did because of this pesticide. So this is not a rodenticide, this is for bugs. This was something that farmers sprayed over crops to prevent bugs from eating them. And what happened was, see rat poison is easy for people to understand because it's like one chain, you know, it's like the rat, something eats the rat and it gets poisoned. But this was a little bit more abstract what happened with DDT. And so what was happening was um, peregrine falcons and bald eagles, they weren't procreating and their numbers went so low, biologists were scrambling to find out why, and they found that this DDT pesticide that they were spraying, little bugs, of course, would eat the poison, then little birds would eat those little bugs, or the little birds would eat the seeds that were treated with this pesticide, much like Roundup. They used it exactly like they did with Roundup, like they mm -hmm. do today with um, and then, of course, something bigger in the food chain would eat those little birds, like a bald eagle or a peregrine falcon, and so on and so forth. So that's the way the food chain works. So what was happening was this pesticide was making their eggshells so brittle that they would just dissolve from the weight of the parent incubating the egg. Mm -hmm. So these eggs were basically dissolving months and months before the babies were developed. So that's how this was affecting them. And again, so it just it, I think it's a really good reference because it shows us that we don't really know what we're doing when it comes to poison. And we, again, it's just like we can't expect any kind of poison in the environment and have it not have unforeseen consequences, just like DDT did. And just like almost everything that we've tried does. So I know I'm going off on a tangent. Like I said, I just no, about this is great. a lot. Okay. So anyways, going back to rat poison. Um, yeah, they're constantly, these poison companies are constantly coming out with new formulations of rat poison saying that they're safe. And I mean, I know I've repeated this multiple times, though the last time I would say it is there's no such thing as safe poison. Mm -hmm. So this is what come, the, the barn owl boxes come in, is that natural predators, that makes all predators in our ecosystem, they're here to do that job for us naturally. Isn't that great? Like that's what they're here to do. So if we can actually attract natural predators, it's very important, of course, that we stop using poison in a specific area before we try and attract natural predators. But we were part of this awesome study with the Berkshire County River Preserve where they do use bait boxes because of ground squirrels that are uh, destroying the levees and the infrastructure of the uh, river preserve. So in two of their locations, instead of using the, the poison bait boxes, they got owl boxes from us as well as raptor perches. So you have raptor perches. They're almost like just a big pole to attract ox and falcons. Yeah. And they were able to prove, long story short, we finally have quantitative evidence that proves that using natural predators, attracting them in this way, is actually a more permanent solution to rodent control, and it's more sustainable. Because really quick, to wrap up, the way the bait boxes work is they never actually provide a permanent solution. All they do is kill the present population of rodents that are in a particular area. But then if that area is still hospitable and friendly for rodents, a new population is just going to move in. Right. So it creates this never ending cycle of poisoning prey and poisoning their predators. And the poison company gets paid every time they fill your box because mm -hmm. it's on a So it's not really in the poison company's um, interest to solve, eradicate the problem permanently. But if we attract natural predators, they can actually do that permanently. Also, because the prey animals are pretty smart, and when they see that there's a presence, a heavy presence of predators, they're not, they're less likely to um, create a permanent population there. Right. So, um, last, yeah, sorry, last thing I want to say about it is because the, the box program has gotten so popular, a lot of people are putting up these boxes and they're expecting that these owls are going to come in their backyard and magically take care of their rodent problem. And I think it's just really important and they get frustrated when it doesn't work. And mm -hmm. it's important to understand that we have to make the area not hospitable to rodents by practicing something that's called exclusion. And we have to do good old trapping too for inside of our homes. Right. Like that, that was my long box. Cool. Thing. So so the idea of the program is that you can people can purchase out or boxes, bird boxes from you guys. And then yes. is there a, re a release coupled with that or are you just expecting for yeah so we sell the boxes that our volunteers make um and they're actually pretty i've recently compared on the market they're pretty cheap they're 150 dollars um they're stained they have shingled roofs they're really cute cool. and <laughs> they have a little partition inside also because barn owls when they have babies this is what makes them such great rodent controls they can have up to 13 babies at one time it's a lot of Whoa. babies I yeah. didn't know that. Oh my gosh. And furthermore, they can actually clutch up to three 
times in one year, which is very rare for birds. Yeah, that's crazy. I didn't know that either. Yeah, and that's why they make such great rodent control because they're just like constantly having babies, constantly feeding. They have really high metabolisms. One barn owl can eat about a thousand rodents a year. Oh so if gosh. you multiply that by all their babies, it's like you're a lot. Yeah. yeah, no kidding. So, um, so sorry, I just got sidetracked. So yeah, that's the idea is that we're prop, you know, we're in- encouraging people to put up these boxes, get rid of poison, and um, yeah. Was that, did that answer your question? Yes. No, that's awesome. Um, so we got, we got a handful more donations, guys. Thank you so much. Um, bad with, with $20 and freedom with 15. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're at $120. That's really cool. You guys, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Yeah. If you guys are interested in donating and, and again, this is the place that Bean was, um, before he was released. So if you're interested in helping more birds like Bean, um, do, do think about that. Thank you so much. Um, so Let's see what else I have written down here. Um, barn owl boxes, how you got in there? Oh, um, so your outreach program um, yeah. with the Raptor Center. Do you guys do mostly, do you do like schools or, or events or, or what does that look we, like? Yeah, we mostly do schools. Um, we, I mean, we do events as well. I've presented in all kinds of situations. Um, I've senior citizen homes, special needs places, all kinds of places. I feel like our... Our impact is greatest. Also, what we cover really adheres to like the teaching standards of like fifth, sixth, seventh grade. Mm -hmm. So um, it's perfect for schools. And also, I think it's just a really, I mean, this sounds cliche, but it's just really important to inspire the youth. Um, Oh, for sure. You know, it's also, like I said, a lot of the cases that we're getting in are things that people aren't aware of. So I do believe that our education outreach program is just as important for adults. I mean, at our open house, I always have adults tell me I learned something all the time. So I do think it's very important for adults, but for the most part, um, we're definitely visiting mostly schools throughout the year and libraries, um, stuff like that. Okay. And then you, you guys bring animal ambassadors out, like you said, so you're, you're non-releasable birds. Some of them become ambassadors. Yes. So we selectively, and I, I remembered what I forgot to say, the release, that's what you asked. And I totally didn't answer your question. For an additional donation, we will release a pair of successfully rehabilitated barn owls on your property once you get our barn owl box up and you send us pictures of the box. um, Oh, I see. Okay, guys, so this is the the program I talked to um, Kim about, Kim Stroud about. So you can buy a barn owl box from the Raptor Center, put it up, send them a picture that, that you've put it up, and then make an additional donation, and they'll bring out barn owls that they've rehabilitated to release on your property. Um, so you have, you have a box and you have, you have owls. That is so cool. Um, Roshan with $10 and Tavian with five, Z with $3. Thank you so much. That's such a cool program. I love that. Yeah. How many people, people like, do that? Like how many yearly? Yeah. We usually get, or there's usually a waiting list for the owls. I mean, oh, as you cool. can, yeah. So it, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty successful. Of course, there's no guarantee that the owls are going to stay. I, that's what it's really important for people to understand that. I would say it's like 50-50. Sometimes they, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they'll leave and come back when it's time to nest and take uh, up the box when it's time to, to mate and nest. So okay. It's a great program. Cool. So your your ambas- your bird ambassadors. Yeah. So the education program, yeah. So we, like I said, we have a pretty good release rate. About 70% gets released back to the wild. If they're not releasable due to some kind of permanent injury, we will selectively bring them into uh, either our education program or if we don't have any room, we'll put them on a placement list and try and get them set up at another center that we approve of um, to either be in an education ambassador or at a zoo. And sometimes, you know, we have a pretty high protocol like what we're asking of our birds is really quite unnatural for a wild animal because we can't be open to the public we have to go visit and do outreach so we're going out to schools and locations so what we're training our birds to do is actually it's a lot you know we're we're asking them to go into a crate Mm -hmm. go into a car and then go to a foreign place and in front of a bunch of strangers so of course not every wild animal not releasable is going to be you know, a good candidate for our program because we require so much. So we will sometimes place them uh, at other centers. For example, we had a bald eagle for years. We tried to train her and she just, just, I don't blame her. (laughs) She did not want to be on someone's glove and I don't blame her. So we were able to place her at the Santa Barbara Zoo. Her name is Avalon. She actually came from the the Channel Islands. So you can see her. She's one of her. Very cool. So how many ambassador birds do you guys have? We have 12. 
Oh, that's a lot. Okay, yeah. cool. So your education programs look like you guys transporting those ambassadors from your center to school or whatever program you do, and then you bring them out and you, you talk about them. Yeah. And then, very cool. Yeah, we usually bring like kind of an even mix of diurnal or day active raptors and nocturnal raptors, obviously with owl. And we get into, I like to talk really heavy about like adaptations because they're so interesting, adaptations of wildlife. Um, and of course, why they're each not releasable, things that you can do to help that species. Um, and just like really cool natural history facts because they all have like awesome mind boggling facts about their species. Cool. Um, what I was going to chat, do you guys have any questions that you've come up with so far? Um, let's get an unbanned for Maki, uh, mods, unless, unless you, you disagree. Um, how'd she get into birds and wanting to help them? We kind of covered that. Um, so you, you already said that inspiring the youth is really important. Um, why, why else do you think that the, the outreach piece is important? Cause you guys, you're not open to the public. So you do, you do all outreach, um, and mostly with kids, right? Yeah. Well, okay. first, like I said, you know, I could say safely 85% at least of the cases that we were because of some kind of negative human impact. Mm. So first and foremost, I believe that is why our education program is so important to a teach people about all the things that they're doing negatively affect wildlife and our shared environment. I always like to stress that. Um, and also to, you know, inspire, like I was saying, inspire them just to care because what we are finding, I mean, what we're all finding is that the youth today is that they're really into their devices. They're really disconnected from nature. I mean, let's face it, we're all pretty much disconnected from nature, but even the younger generations, they're even more so just because of technology. Right. So I think it's really important, you know, especially when I'm dealing with young kids, I'm not asking a whole lot of them. I'm not asking them to like write letters and get rid of poison bait boxes at their local businesses. I'm just inspiring them to like, just get outside and just care. Right. And I feel like connecting them to these really mind boggling, amazing facts about these species kind of opens the doorway to that. Because if you find them interesting and really cool, then obviously you're going to care a little bit more. And I've even seen some of the impact that these programs can make on children. I actually had a child um, get rid of all of the poison bait boxes at her school in her school district. Wow. Uh, so yeah. That's like, awesome. I about it. Yeah. So like, I think that's all really important. And, um, and also, you know, these birds by law, uh, if we do have birds in our care that are not releasable, we have to be showing them to the public. Um, actually each bird has to by law be shown to the public 12 times a year. Oh, um, wow. yeah. Um, and I do think it's important because that's, they're fulfilling their role because that they have a job in captivity. They're not just like, again, we're not a sanctuary. They're ambassadors for their species to go out and teach people about their species and, how yeah how to protect them and why to care about them so. yeah that's yeah. awesome um punk just donated 50 dollars. punk thank you for doing that so we're at 233 dollars um we got a few questions from chat um the first one is is how long does it take to rehabilitate a bird that's a great question it it's every single case is different even two cases with the same broken bone will be completely different because it there's so many factors involved, like how the bone is broken. If it's like a transverse break versus an oblique break, you know, that's going to change their, their prognosis um, and their personality. If they're really crazy and thrashy, they're going to have a longer healing time because mm -hmm. they're not calm. Um, so gosh, it's different for every single injury in case. I would say like for an orphan, if we receive like a nestling orphan, let's just say like a, a barn owl, because like we, for example, we did I think 150 orphaned barn owls this year. This year, so many, oh my gosh! So many orphaned barn owls, from you know a nestling like a chick to release time, it's probably about four months. Okay, that's for raising a baby. Right. For an in, uh, this is kind of an interesting fact that I usually tell when I do uh, education programs is birds have hollow bones. Mm -hmm. Oh, at any flighted bird that can fly has hollow bones. You could like a straw, you could see right through it. Um, they have those because they're pneumatic. Basically they breathe through their bones. That's one of the magical, magical ways that they can fly. But because of that, their bones heal really quickly. So if they break a bone that's pneumatic, it's going to heal in about five to seven days. Mm -hmm. So if someone doesn't get that bird into care in time, each day that the bird goes without getting 
you know, professional care, the prognosis of release is going to get poorer and poorer. Yeah. Um, but a bone, like I said, will fully fuse in about like two weeks maximum. So, and then after that, depending on how much extension they have, we have different physical therapy protocols. Sometimes we have to do really aggressive physical therapy because, you know, funny enough, especially red tail hawks, there's also personality things that we see between species. Red tail hawks are notoriously lazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just are. They're, they're lazy to learn how to hunt when they're babies. And they're, they're lazy to work out their injuries. Um, and I don't blame them. You know, they're in this nice uh, the aviary fit, really beautiful. They're getting free food. So mm -hmm. they don't want to have to actually work. Right. So some of these patients, I just had one. I had to like go catch them every day with a net, do like 10 wing extensions and make him fly. So that's a long answer to the question. But yeah, every single case is totally unique and different. Yeah, for sure. Um, I definitely had that issue with Bean is, was him being a little yeah. bit on the, on the lazier side. <laughs> yeah. um, so another question that came up um, is, what do I do if I find a bird in front of my house? That's a great question. So what do you do if you find a bird in front of your house? You know, it's great. First of all, don't ever try and do anything on your own. Nothing. Not even give the bird water because here's the thing about birds. They have a hole. If you, if Bean opened his or her mouth, I forget it was, if it was a male or female, male. you know, they have a huge hole in the center of their tongue. All birds have this, it's called a glottis uh -huh. and that's directly to their trachea. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people that they find injured birds and they're like, I've been putting water into its mouth. You could actually end up drowning and killing the bird. Mm -hmm. oh, don't, I just tell people, don't try and do anything. And every single bird has such specific diets, literally. I mean, even songbirds, like, you know, some eat insects, some only eat insects, some eat nuts and seeds. Like, so keep it warm and quiet, get it into a box, warm, quiet place, and get on the phone and try and find your local rehabilitator. Everyone will have your local rehabilitator's number, like the local authority. So your local police, local animal control. Also, don't be afraid of animal control. They're great agencies. We work with them all the time. They get a bad rap, and I think people are, like, terrified to call them. But we network with them all the time. They're actually not allowed to make any decisions for wildlife without calling a rehabilitator. So, um, yeah, please don't try and take things into your own hands. If you ever find a baby bird, who's ever heard that if you find a baby bird, don't touch it with your hands because you'll get your human scent on it and the parents will care definitely, for it? Definitely, definitely heard that one. I grew up here being told that as well. I'm here to tell you all that is a myth. It's absolutely not true. Um, very few birds actually can smell. They don't have developed olfactory senses. Turkey vultures can smell, some seabirds can smell, but most birds cannot. So one of the best things that you can do if you find a baby bird and you have determined this is very, it's not injured on the fall, mm -hmm. um, you can put it back in the nest because the parents can't do that for them and they would be really thankful because they don't have hands. Right. So they can't, <laughs> but absolutely pick up a baby bird, put it back in its nest. And if a baby bird is naked, you have to pick that thing up because it can't thermoregulate. Mm -hmm. So if you ever find like a little pink naked baby bird, just hold that thing in your hand and get a rehabilitator on the phone because um, again, they can just die in a matter of like a half hour from not keeping warm. Um, so like I said, every local authority will have your, your local rehabilitation facility, phone number and contact information. Um, I can't stress enough never to take to your own hands. I also like to say, you know, this is another challenge that we face with social media is how often wildlife is portrayed as like domestic, like in a domestic way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times people come in and they're like holding an animal, they're petting it, yeah. they're talking to it. I actually had a woman come in one time and the thing is, I always tell people this, if a wild animal lets you approach it, that means there's something seriously wrong with it. Right. Probably probably like close to death if it doesn't try and run away from you. Mm -hmm. So, and never try and give it food either, because just like a human, if you were starving for a month and someone tried to give you like a big fat steak, you'd probably die because your get, you know, your GI tract would go into shock. Yeah. We, we give them fluid therapy for 48 hours before we eat food if they're emaciated. So you really have to be a professional. I know I'm going off on a million different directions here, but no, it's great. Appreciate okay. It. So, yeah, it's really important just to kind of, like, get it to someone that knows what they're doing because you could do more damage. Oftentimes, people do more damage trying to take things into their own hands 
rather than just get it immediately to a rehabilitator. And the story I was just going to tell is this woman once, she had a great horned owl. And just to put this in perspective, great horned owls are apex predators. They have 750 pounds of pressure per square inch in their grip. So they mm-hmm. can break bone. Like they could do a lot of damage to you. Yeah. And this woman felt like she had a spiritual connection with this owl, which she oh may have gosh. had. I, I consider myself to be a spiritual person. So I'm not saying that she didn't, but she decided that she wanted to take this owl home with her for the evening and she slept with it in her bed. Oh my gosh. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Just for <laughs> reference, you guys, 750 PSI and a, a great horn script. I think, I think an average human male is like 35 or 40 something like that um so yeah sleeping with it maybe not not the the best idea okay yeah and then she and then she brought it into the center brought it in the next day and um and then you know of course i grabbed it the way i'm trained to handle birds to protect myself and a bird and of course she was horrified because i wasn't cradling it like a baby but yeah it's really hard to explain to people that you know, wild animals, if they're letting you like touch it or pet it, that means they're, they're probably really not close. Okay. Not okay. Yeah. Right. So just wanted to share that story with some of the, I we see all kinds of crazy things. At yeah. Our center. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you said that. I get a lot of DMS um, because of the, the, the content that I talk about on this channel of people saying like, I found this baby bird. What do I do? Um, okay. And my answer to everybody always and everybody that's watching is, is just contact your your closest wildlife rehab center um, because I I don't I'm I'm not you know I, I don't work for a rehab center and I don't I don't know the bird and I'm not near you and I I can't help you so um, yeah for sure I'm I'm glad you gave that advice I appreciate it um, so another question that came up here is does the center have certain criteria that birds must meet to be released or does it differ between species? That's a great question. It, the criteria for release definitely varies between species. So um, let's just fo- I'll focus really quickly on like diurnal raptors, mm-hmm. nocturnal raptors. So diurnal raptors, day raptors, that's like, you know, hawks, falcons, eagles. And when I teach kids, I usually say, you know, those birds, their superpower is their vision. Yeah. Basically, they see fat, they see in fast motion, they see further distances than we can. Their power in being such efficient hunters is all in their eyes. So we, those birds really need both eyes to be released. Mm -hmm. However, owls, on the other hand, they don't really use their eyes at all. They locate their prey by their, by their hearing, by sound. So we can release owls with one eye. We put them through a series of tests. What we'll do, we just released, I think, four one-eyed screech owls in a row back to back. We'll isolate Yeah, we'll isolate them in a special aviary that we have that has a lot of, because they not only need their hearing to locate the prey, but they also need it to avoid um, uh, obstructions. Because it's, they use something called stereoscopic hearing. It's not like echolocation, but let's just say kind of, they, they do okay. navigate well, okay? Uh-huh. So, um, so we will kind of change up the obstacles, like the different perches and logs and stuff in the aviary every day and put in live prey. And if that owl proves to us that they can hunt live prey every day, we don't give them anything dead for mm-hmm. like two weeks straight, then they get cleared and they can get released. Did you say two, did you say two days or two weeks? Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Two weeks. Yeah. So, and that's just, that's just for like a one-eyed owl. That's just the protocol for a one-eyed owl. Um, there are certain protocols that we do have to adhere to with fish and wildlife. Um, we are licensed true for every single licensed uh, rehabilitation center. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they, first of all, they own our birds. We don't own, like, even the ambassadors. We don't own them. Government right. owns them. Um, and they dictate all of our laws. They keep us in practice. Um, so their laws say that it is illegal to keep uh, any bird alive that is an amputee or needs to be amp- or any wing amputated. Oh, wow. We, uh, we cannot keep any bird alive that only has one leg and that can't perch. So those are, those are laws that we have to follow, and they're for good reason because a lot of people, you know, if you don't Thank work you, with birds, I, it, it may be difficult to understand this, but a lot of people are like, think that alive is always better, and a bird that cannot perch is that's the quality of life is absolutely, it's not better for that bird to be yeah. alive. Yeah, I'll just put it that way. So yeah, there's certain criteria that we have to follow in, in regards to the law, but we always give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, so when I was talking about 
ear thing. If we get an adult that has an injury that normally would dictate that it was it's a non-releasable case. For example, we got this red tail hawk in earlier this year. She was banded, and the band told us that she was 17 years old, and she had one eye. But clearly, she came in at a great weight. She was shot, unfortunately. Some jerk shot her. But oh, other geez. than that, yeah, she came in at a great weight. So that told us that she clearly sustained this injury after she had gained the skill set to be a survivor, because that's a whole other thing. Getting Actually growing old enough to be an adult in the world, the wildlife world is a, a feat in itself because mm -hmm. not, they're not all the fittest, right? The survival right. of the fittest. So, but this one particular case, obviously she had been surviving this as an adult a long time. So where we would normally say a one-eyed red tail hawk, no way, we let her go. So if we think that they have a chance, we'll definitely give them the benefit of the doubt and, and, and try and release them because I know I would rather be given the benefit of the doubt than, right. you know. Yeah. Is, so are a yeah. lot of the injuries, um, this was, I mean, a question in chat, but I was going to ask it anyway. Um, this bird was shot. Um, so the most common injuries that you guys get, is it, it's like rodenticide poisoning and is, are birds uh, that are shot common at the center? So common. Sadly. Really? Oh yeah. It's so common. I would say we probably get at least, I would say at least two shot cases a month. We have wow, two that's so much more than I thought. Yeah, I mean, they'll come in usually with a broken wing. That's mm -hmm. that's what they come in with. And then we get them x-rayed and we see that they have lead all, you know, a bullet yeah. or lead. So, but yeah, it's more, much more common than you would think, unfortunately. Jeez, that's awful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some other common injuries, like our most common injuries, of course, is like hit by car, super common. Mm -hmm. um, what I always tell people is please don't throw trash out your window, even if it's like biodegradable, like an apple core or something. You're like, oh, this biodegrades in nature because if you throw it out your car window and it, and it lands like even on the side of the road, it just attracts creators, scavengers to the side of the road, which then, of course, attracts their predators. So, That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So um, lots of car strikes, lots of um, tri tree trimming the wrong time of year. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, all birds have different times of year where they – raise their young and fledge. So we tell people not to trim their trees between March and October. Okay. Um, so yeah, tree trimming, uh, uh, lots of, some electrocutions because of the faulty power uh, line. Yeah. Um, what else? Poisoning is of course huge. Uh, I'm, if I remember more, I will tell you, but that's, that's what's highest on my, yeah, probably the most common. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Here's where back to back questions here. I hope that's I hope that's okay with you. <laughs> um, so somebody's been asking. Um, we've talked about imprinted birds. Um, if a young bird falls into rehab or shelter, what are the procedures you keep you take to keep them wild? That's a great question. I'm so glad somebody asked that. So what we do? Some of our ambassadors, uh, the non releasable birds. Luckily, they will foster for us. We only have two two of our ambassadors that will do this and that is just a win-win for everybody because if we don't have a species that will foster for us we go to great lengths not to imprint for those of you who don't know what imprinting is because we're talking about this like everybody knows but i'm just gonna offer a very brief because yeah that'd be great we assume that everybody knows okay imprinting is something natural that happens any creature in the four, first, generally, first four weeks of their life, mm -hmm. first four weeks of any animal's life, they're supposed to, you know, be born and see their own family, their parents, their siblings, and then they identify with who they are, what they are, etc. If they are removed from that situation during that critical developmental phase, the first four weeks, and they're only raised by a human, they will permanently imprint on a human being. And once that happens, they are not, they can never be released to the wild. Um, right. They never. No, you, you can't teach them how to hunt once that happens. They don't know how to recognize prey or predators or so. Anyways, yeah, that's what mm -hmm. that's what thing is, and that's why we, because our goal is always release, we do go to great lengths to avoid doing this. So we have different methods that we use. We have some taxidermy birds that we use. In fact, if you, really? yeah, if we posted really funny videos of this, if um, you can follow us on social media and see all of our work too. We have a really great Instagram account that I also co um whatever overseas cool. um, is it just ohio after center yeah ohio after center we posted some fun videos uh during the last nesting season of me feeding the baby owls with like 
I wear a ghillie boot, so it's like a full on head to toe. Uh, makes me look like I'm like leaves or a tree. And we cover our hands. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. We use like a taxidermy bird and, and it works well. You can see in the video that they totally focus on this bird's face. And sometimes we'll leave her, we'll take turns with her. She's, we call her our mama. She's our great Cornell mama. We'll put her in like different, one of the cages with different babies. They love her. We need to get a new one pretty soon because she's kind of ready. Because they like to <laughs> climb on top of her. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we cover ourselves. We don't let them see our faces or our hands. Um, we use different kinds of puppets or taxidermy things. And then the best case scenario is, of course, when we do have non-releasable birds that will foster. And this is a win-win for everybody because all birds of prey, they do have the natural desire to parent. They, they naturally do it in the wild every day. They mate for life, by the way, so they do it with the same partner every year, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so for our ambassador, Captivity, you know, most of them will never get to experience that, which is sad. But if they do lay eggs, they have, they have to be a good candidate for this, which there's multiple things that make them that. But if they lay eggs and they're ready to receive young, if we can give them orphaned babies, those babies have a much better start. I mean, because like I said, we go through a lot to prevent imprinting, but it's much better for the birds. Because of course, they're being raised by a bird of their own kind. All of these birds, they they kind of snuggle a lot when they're with their parents. They preen them. Um, take off their feather shafts and feathers that are in. So there's a lot of, you know, physical attention that mm -hmm. when they're, they get none, we can't give that to them because we don't want them to get used to our touch. So anyways, when our ambassadors foster, great start for the young ones. It's really great for our non ambassadors. And then what we'll do in that scenario is once the bird is old enough to be able to learn how to hunt, then we will take those babies away and then we'll put them in the kill tanks and teach them how to Orphans. Got it. Cool. Um, Monstrous with $10. Thank you. So he said, wanted to support a local group. Cool. Um, appreciate that. Um, Zoya with $2. Uber with $5. Thank you, guys. Um, Jose has been asking in chat for a while how long it takes to rehabilitate a raccoon. Is that a similar answer to, to your bird of prey question? You know, I definitely, I've never rehabilitated a raccoon. Like oh. I said, yeah, if we receive a raccoon, I only will triage them, stabilize them, and then I will... Erin Lefty, who was a raccoon lady, and she rehabilit rehabilitates all the raccoons out of her garage. So, oh wow, uh, I don't actually know how long. I know them as orphans. You usually have to set up a social group for them because they're really social. Mm -hmm. So you can't raise a single. That's like, and I know all the time. Re other re like. Do you have a raccoon that's, that's this age? Because they want to get them together, and then they will usually release them as a family because they lost their own family group. So that's all I really know about raccoons. I know what formula to feed them and how to like kind of triage a wound or give them. Then like I, I kind of transfer them to our raccoon lady. Got so. it. Very cool. Okay. Um, go with $10, seven with $10, go with $10. Go asked, um, are there any benefits of young birds of prey that grow up in rehab that they wouldn't have growing up in the wild? Yeah, that's thanks for asking. That's an awesome question. And it's a surprising answer because usually you would think that, of course, you know, being raised in an unnatural setting, it's just a disadvantage all the way, but it's actually not. And especially for our red tailed hawks. Yeah. And I, this is true for all of our birds because if I'm going to tell you guys how a red tailed hawk parent um, weans its young, it's really sad. <laughs> so, what they do is they do, they practice something that we like to call tough love. So the parent will, you know, parent comes in, bring is bringing the, the young juvenile food. At this point, the juvenile looks like it's an adult. You know, it's mm -hmm. probably about four months old, but it is never hunted for itself yet. It just mm -hmm. keeps getting popped off. So that's what the parents do. They'll just drop off food for the baby or the young juvenile. Mm -hmm. And um, when they think it's time for that young one to get out there on its own and start hunting on its own, they'll go longer and longer periods without bringing the bird food. Mm -hmm. And red tail hawks are super easy to spot a juvenile, especially in like September, October, because they'll just be crying all day long and they're, they're begging the parents to come in and feed them. And it kind of sounds like a wimpy red tail call. It's like, yeah. and they'll do that all day long. Um, and the parents, like I said, they'll go longer and longer periods and eventually the parents just don't come back and they just abandon them. Mm -hmm. 
And those juveniles have to figure out, wow, my parents aren't coming back. Okay, I have to go out and do this on my own. At that point, there's no really telling. They may have not really gotten much practice themselves about, you know, on hunting. And I don't know what their body condition is. Have they been, are they somewhat initiated at that point? Mm -hmm. that they haven't been feeding them. So conversely, at our center, when we have an orphaned red-tailed hawk, we keep our red-tailed hawks in that flight that you were in mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. two months. Wow. Um, and, yeah, and they have to show us that they can hunt for two months straight. So I that's far more practice than any red tail gets in the wild before they have to be on their own. So in that respect, yes, um, they actually do get kind of a better start at our center in captivity than with their parents. And of course, I'm not saying that it's being raised with their parents is always preferable. In fact, we sometimes will put up like fake nests. We always try and reunite orphans with their parents can if that mm -hmm. option is available to us. But um, they do get quite a lot of training because we really want them to be successful. Got it. Okay, yeah. good questions, you guys. Thank yeah. you so much for asking all of those. Um, okay, well, I feel like we've just been like hounding you with questions. Thank you so much um for for answering all of them is there anything else that you want to talk about before we close up here I'll, also we're at 300 dollars in donations zach with 20 dollars. thank you so much yeah, awesome i yeah it's the first time i heard of this program this is really awesome thanks for having me um no you really touched on all of the points that i'm most passionate about um, great the thing and yeah follow us on social media if you're on it because it's it's pretty entertaining and you can kind of follow our work and all the and thanks so much for supporting you guys. Really awesome. Yeah, Thank of you. course. So I just, I linked their Instagram and chat there, and then you can do command org and chat if you want to check out their website. Um, I assume they can find the, the other social media's um, accounts through there. Um, so... Yeah, guys, thank you for those of you who donated. Nick Knack with $10 said, I love birds. Thank you. So we're at $310. Um, thank you. Thank you guys so much for watching and for donating. I appreciate it. Jacqueline, thank you so much for your time. This is super informative, really, really cool. And we, we so appreciate you guys having, taking Bean in for that, for that last leg. He really, he needed that boost. Of course, that's what we do. So anytime. <laughs> and Jeff with $20. Thank you so much. He said, glad Bean had some great people to help him. Me too. I'm very, very glad. Um, okay. I appreciate, I appreciate you, um, you coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maya, for having me. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. All right, guys, Jeff with the $20 to end us off. Thank you so much. $330. So cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, sorry about the audio in the beginning. Um, Danny DeVito with $9.43. Um, so now we're at a, at a nice $339.43. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, the audio throughout, was it throughout the whole podcast? Anonymous with $5. Thank you, Tavian Smith. Yeah, good guy. Good guy. Um, say the line. Twitch is um, an untapped reservoir for doing good. Um, I'm so lucky to be a part of it. Uh, Jacqueline was wonderful. She had so much good information. Oh my gosh. Um, I, I could talk to her for days about Birds of Prey. She knows a lot. Um, anonymous with five dollars. Thank you so much. Um, she was a bird nerd. True. Those are my favorite kinds of people. Um, yeah, she, she was awesome. And that was a lot of good information about, about rodenticides and stuff like that. If you're anywhere near the Ojai Raptor Center, you should look into that barn owl program. I think that's so cool. Like, you can just, you can buy a barn owl box and make a donation and get barn owls released to your property as, as rodent control instead of using rat poisoning. Um, because that, as we learned, is not the best. Um. Sorry, I got distracted. Um. Thank you guys again for the, for the really good questions. There were a lot of really good questions in here today. Um. I appreciate that. We appreciate the Ohio Raptor Center for what they did for Bean and what they do for a bunch of birds every year. A thousand birds or a thousand animals they intake a year and their their release rates like what she say seventy percent something crazy. So they do some really really good work um, down in Ohio. So every question was great. White people happy. True. She did say that. Great question. Great question. Boys, great questions. Okay. So. 
Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it. Those donations went straight to the Ojai Raptor Center. Um, so you're supporting more birds like being more animals um, that, that need the help. Panda with $8. These podcasts are great. Thank you so much. You're great. I appreciate it. Um, $357.43. $367. <laughs> Rowdy, thank you for rounding that out. That was definitely bothering me. Um, <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. Um, guys, thank you for watching. Miz and I are going to stream tonight. Um, we're going to hang out and then we're going to go out. So I will be back here in a few minutes. Um, da, 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 so, I suppose I'm going to host Miz because we're we're gonna be streaming. How are you gonna host me? Just host Russell. Dionysus with a dollar thirty. Thank you. Um, so now we're at we're three hundred sixty-eight dollars and thirty cents. You want me to host Russell? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm is it, is Russell live? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll host Russell. Jack with a dollar and a cent. Okay. Are we? Gonna, are we rounding it up? Connor with $33. $402.31. Huge. Connor K. Thank you so much. $400, chat. That's awesome. Thank you. Maybe stall a while for donos? But Jacqueline's gone now. <laughs> I don't have, I don't know what else to talk about. Um. Good morning. I'm alive! Okay. Wonderful. Thank you guys again. I've been mean. I've been trying to get the Ohio Raptor Center on the podcast for a while since we started talking to them about Bean. Um, so I'm really glad we got to do that. They're a really great organization. Oh gosh. Pop. Ithras is 1769, and we're at 420. <laughs> All right, that's great. Thank you guys so so much. I really do appreciate it. I'm really glad that we finally got to get them on the podcast. They're an awesome organization. They do really good stuff. Um, so another great podcast for the books. Um, thank you guys for being here. I'll see you in a few minutes. I'm going to go go, go host Russell. Everybody say, oh, my gosh, scoop with $50. I'm, I'm not hosting Russell. I changed my mind. I'm staying live for the rest of the night. Scoop with $50, $470. Thank you so much, dude. Oh my god. You pussies won't get it to 500. No. What? It's still the podcast. You, you I mean, many. No, stop talking. I don't want to. It's, I'm not good at cutting stuff out of the bots. Stop. Okay. Four hundred and, wait. Red plastic mug with a hand. Tip $10. Thank you very much. Red Spy with the with the resub. Thank you. Anonymous with $5. Oh my gosh. No way. Cry with $5. Pog to 500 we go. Waxy Fun with the sub. Thank you so much. And go with the $5. Bean. Thank you so much. Anybody, any any $5 donors here? Hello? Uh, con man with the four months in a row. Thank you so much. $495. Bean. Pepe hands, but also feel strong, man. Pause champ. <laughs> Okay, if we don't get five dollars, it is a okay. I will, I will donate five dollars. Protect with the six months. Thank you so much for the sub. Dud with the five dollar donation, five hundred dollars today Hooray! for the Ohio Raptor Center. Thank you guys so much. Um, 
Thank you guys so much. So cool. That's an awesome donation. Let's and Denali, get to a thousand. Denali with four dollars and twenty cents. Heart and chat for that guy. Midnight with ten dollars. Midnight. I think that's your second or third donation. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that. Five hundred and fourteen dollars and twenty cents. Thank you guys. Absolutely wonderful. Oh my gosh, the lonely one with three dollars. This has never happened before at the end of a podcast. Thank you, guys. JMB Underground with $5 for the goal. Thank you so much. 522.20. Emily freaking Jane with the three months in a row. Thanks, babe. You're the best. All right. Boys. Calm. With the three months. Look at that healthy sub count. I'm so happy. Cow with $5. Can I give a bird cybernetic enhancements? I want a cyborg bird Maya. Maybe someday. Um, not today. $527.20. Jack with a dollar and a cent. $529. Oh, oh. Jack with another dollar and a cent. And we're at $533. JMB Underground with the sub. Dionysus with the dollar. Add these two emotes already. What is that? Ew. Ew. No. Julian with $77, Anonymous with $280, Julian with $77.77, Escanor Cloud with $5, wrap it up, time for Miz, Nuclear Armed Hog with seven months in a row, thank you so much dude, that's crazy, and Jack with another dollar and a cent. $616.80. Weren't we at like 300 something? What, what's going on? Val, val, value, I can't read, value size with a dollar and 12 cents. Thank you Can I have some water? so much. Oh my god. Ugh. You okay? Ugh. More donos after the podcast? Yeah, this never happens. I feel like it's always at the very beginning of the podcast. Ugh. Jack with a dollar and a cent. It's always... Oh, hi, Tricky. Um, no, the, I got the same cup sent to me in my P.O. box. Um, I feel like it's always at the very, very beginning of the podcast before, um, before they even talk about the organization, isn't it? Like, you guys just know that it's going to be about a type of animal, and you're like, I love that animal. And so you're just like, at the beginning of the podcast. It's True! Like, it, that's, that's when all the donos come in. But this is nuts. This this hasn't happened before, but I really do appreciate it. Um, thank yes, you guys. Sir. Everybody that donated today. Yes, sir. No. Thank you so much. Cow with a dollar. Can I nurse a bird back to health with my own milk? No. It's a good time to end, end the podcast. All right. I'm going to host Russell. I really, really appreciate you guys being here. I've already said that. Thank you to those of you who... Thank you to those of you who stick around and watch the podcast. You know how much it means to me. It... it, it makes my my time on twitch so wonderful nima with three dollars and eighty cents thank you so much say the line again twitch twitch.tv is an untapped reservoir for doing good nocturn nocturnic knock knock who's there with three dollars <laughs> with three dollars <laughs> Thank you so much. One, two, three with four dollars and fifty six cents, seven, eight, nine. Pineapples with the six months in a row. You guys are insane. Check LSF. No, it is not today is not the day. This is the podcast still. Okay. Doing this podcast makes me love being on Twitch. I'm I'm so Text with another $10. Thank you so much. I am so, so blessed to be in this position and and to, 
to be able to to be a platform to, to teach you guys about these things that are so important to me. It, it makes my week. I, I really do look forward to this every week. It means the world to me. Connor K with a two-month sub. Thank you so much. And thank you for your donation earlier. Ply with four months in a row. And text with the tier one. Thank you for the sub and thank you for the donations, dude. You're wonderful. Guys, I'm going to host Russell. $641.29. Thank you so, so much for your donations today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for learning. It means the world to me that you watch these in addition to my streams. Thank you. I'll see you guys in a few minutes. Go say hi to Russell for me. Okay? We're gonna... We, we have a handful of stuff. We have a handful of things planned for tonight, so it should be a good time. Oh my gosh. Cow with a dollar. Those birds she was talking about left them just like my dad did. I'm sorry to hear that, cow. I hope that that's a joke. And scoop with the tier one. Thank you. Okay. I'll see you guys in a few minutes. Thank you so much. Love you all. Bye.